test, test. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Jason. Wonderful job. So um, we're going to talk about AI and how we used artificial intelligence for predictive maintenance. Um, I'm going to crack a few eggs here. I'm going to make some statements. I'm going to go against the things you heard today. Um, and I truly believe that the future of artificial intelligence is not going to lie with data scientists. It's going to lie with people like Jason. Jason is going to be the adopter of AI. I think Paula hit it right on the nose when she said the biggest adopter or the biggest challenge we have of adopting this technology, the digital twin artificial intelligence IoT, is change management, how we deal with change. Okay? I, I, I struggle to see all these vendors out here and not talk about the culture change of it. And that's how I'm going to go through this. So the partner ecosystem, so uh, we're Lakeside Process Controls. Consider us an, an integrator in this project. We don't have an artificial intelligence solution, so I couldn't go and sell that, right? So I had to go out there in the market and look for one. Uh, Emerson Automation Solution, this was a key part that, uh, that was fundamental in the, uh, the adoption of culture change of, of this project. And then Cortec.ai, which provided the artificial intelligence, that's the engine behind the results we're getting. So the case study is an industrial autoclave. It doesn't matter if you know the asset. It can be anything in your mind from your plant. Um, it's a very complex asset. It has a lot of parts that move very frequently. It's a critical asset, and it runs 24-7. So I was asked to, Blair, can you please improve the reliability of this autoclave? Right? And anyone from the reliability world knows you cannot uh, improve reliability more than when at the engineering stage. So what I could say is at least we can monitor some conditions and give you some forewarnings of, of things going wrong. So, the first step we did is we built on the fundamentals. I had been trained up, I grew up in the reliability world of doing RCM, failure, failure modes and effects analysis. This was the biggest, I guess, biggest, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The biggest step we took in the right direction because I'm gonna go through where I failed and I failed miserably a bunch of times, right? But this was the first big step. So if anyone says you can do an artificial intelligence project without doing FMA, I would challenge that, okay? Because what that did is, we stepped through and we found over 2,000 ways that autoclave could fail, okay? Right, there is no way, again, I heard this this morning and I will debate it, that artificial intelligence or any kind of technology will detect 100% of your failures. It's not possible. Artificial intelligence cannot predict that some guy's gonna smash that with a forklift, right? There's no way, so challenge that. So anyway, so we built on the, on the fundamentals. We sat down and we did an FMEA analysis. You, that, also helped with the culture change because that person or the team of the end users was in there going, aha, that could fail that way, that could fail that way, right? And Dale talked about it uh, yesterday, Dale with a hat on backwards right now, and he said the biggest, one of the biggest challenges was moving the cheese. He had to move his cheese at Honda, right? And I'm going there as an outsider and I started moving the cheese, right? And that's a big challenge. All of a sudden, if you get them involved in the process, they start to figure out how it's going to fail you're making that moving the cheese less and less intrusive. So here, here's my failures. This is not what I get paid for, but so failure one, I said, okay, give me your autoclave. I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna start doing manual data collection. I'm gonna go in there with the technology that's out there today. If you map it to the uptime element, the frameworks, right? That's the asset condition monitoring. Um, we used ultrasound technology. So if I go back, the failure mode and effect analysis and the history of failures of that autoclave was the uh, diaphragm valves, there's these little valves and they operate a lot. Uh, was the number one issue that they had with failures. It caused a lot of failures, a lot of downtime. The, the, the cost of downtime wasn't necessarily the fact that they were down, is if they lost a valve and they lost the temperature inside that oclave during a batch, there is multi-million dollars worth of product in that. So I went in there and said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do manual condition monitoring, that's what I do, this is gonna be great, and, and the project's gonna be done. I did not set out to do an AI project. So, we did this, I failed, because what happened was it sounded like a Die Hard movie with Bruce Willis inside that autoclave, right? There's just so many things moving and happening, and the whole point of condition monitoring is that you take repeatable um, values, right? Very hard to do in a complex asset like that, right? You're measuring degradation over time, right? So that was fail, failure number one. So I had to go back to the end user and said, yeah, what you just paid me for, it's, it's no good, okay? So number two, I said, this is, this is good, I got this one. I know you paid me for the first one, I'm not giving your money back, but give me some more money and I'm gonna put an online system on. I'm gonna put sensors on there that are gonna monitor it 24 seven. And what I settled to do was I'm gonna create rules. I'm gonna say, okay, if vibration equals X, or what in this case we use ultrasound sensors on the valves to tell if that valve's leaking by or not. I'm gonna create rules, very simple. I'm gonna figure out when the valve's open, 
ultrasound is X amount and valves close, it's this amount, right? I'm gonna set baselines, this is gonna be great. This is actually the graph that it looks like on that left-hand side, stage right, I guess, right? Um, so what is that, right? How do you create rules on that? So we later involved Cortic and they came back to me and gave me this number. This is a, this is a factorial of 32. So this is how many rules I would have to create right, for one value, okay? That's a big number. So now I'm gonna need a lot more money, end user. I gotta create a lot of rules here, right? So that, this is not possible, right? So the other option was I can create one rule during one operating state, but reliability best practices tells us that failure is random, how do I know that I'm gonna, when I create that rule in that one operating state that I'm gonna catch those failures? Chances are I'm not, right? So that didn't work out either, so I failed twice, in case you're counting. Right? I had one early win of doing an FMEA, and I failed twice now. So with the online sensors, we were told to prove it. And what you see here is an actually lab test results. We had a lot more tests than this. The upper level is the ultrasound when that valve is open. The bottom blue is when the valve is closed. You can see over there on the, on the picture, we induced a failure. We talked to the valve manufacturer, said, what does this valve look like when it fails? Right? And said, the seat starts to wear out, it's a Teflon seat. It starts to leak by, leaks by, the, the autoclave can't get the temperature, it goes to temperature too quick, blah, blah, blah. So the key thing to note in this change that even with that small, small little nick, there was a change in that, that pattern. So what we went down, we went down to human pattern recognition. And, and this is actually end user drove us to this solution saying, before you give me your little black box that's gonna make everything all better, let me see the data, okay? So this is culture change number two. Let me see the data. So this is a test for you guys. You guys, I'm assuming you're all valve experts, right? Leave your hand down if you're a valve expert. So you're a valve expert, that's great. So you're a valve expert. This is the trend of a valve. This is the steam valve going into the autoclave over a complete batch. This is the second batch. 151 days apart, there's 358 batches ran in between that time frame. I'll ask you guys, does this have a similar pattern? If there's any data scientists, do not answer because you're gonna give me some weird statistics, but this, does, it, does it look the same? Thank you, that could've went really wrong. <laughs> so no, that's great, because it went the same. So what we just did is we just did pattern recognition. That looks the same. If you go back to this slide, if there was a failure, we would see a complete different pattern, right? So the first time I can go back to the end user and say, I can't tell you how your valve is, but I can tell you your valve is operating the same as it was on February 5th. So if you're gonna go hit that button to start, right, I can tell you it's gonna operate the same on February 5th. I can't tell you that it's gonna to operate tomorrow, but at least we did that part. So what we just did was one valve, two batches, right? How do you do, there's 50 some odd parameters on this autoclave, how do you do that real time, constantly, right? You need either a whole lot of team of reliability engineers or you need some kind of uh, AI to do that for you. So we added context to data. So we took the condition monitoring data of these ultrasounds and we took the process data. We didn't set out to do the process data. Remember, I was just gonna magically solve this by putting ultrasound, creating a bajillion rules, right? So we took context with that data. And this is the first time that I got uh, surprised because of the value of just getting that data and doing simple things like OE calculations, uh, downtime calculations, availability calculations, right? That comes out of having context from your data. Too often we have a world over here where my condition monitoring data is over here and way over here is my production data. They don't ever meet. When you combine those two, you get a heck of a lot of information. And I can tell you right now, through the software platform we're running, I have more information on their batches than they have at the facility right now and I can get it on my phone. Okay, so this comes the challenging part, right? Who moved my cheese? So what we did is, I am not a data scientist, as you probably already figured out. I had no idea what AI was before starting this journey, but we built the model for this. Okay, so I get, let's see if I can get this out. Um, so I wrote down some things I heard today, right, about AI saying, don't worry about how the model works. Don't worry about it, that's our problem, right? No, no, because when I started trying to find out vendors who could do this for me, they said, we'll take your data, we'll cleanse your data, and we'll give you the output. Okay, so you're, you're, 
I'm already moving cheese, then you're moving my cheese, right? So let's think about your gas tank. Okay, your gas tank, right? You used to have a gas gauge, and you, you still do, of course, everyone still does, it has a gas gauge, right? You used to hit a quarter and go, oh, I still got a little bit, right? Technology evolved, now we say we have 100 kilometers to empty, okay? That kind of defeats the purpose of a gas gauge now, right? But how much would you trust that gas gauge? If, you, if it said you had, I'm using kilometers, I'm Canadian, so 20 miles to empty, and the gas station was 21 miles, do you risk it? Absolutely, you do. Right? You do. Uh, no, you do. I, I, have, I have hit that zero mark. I'm like, whoo! This is free at this point, right? So, because... <laughs> right, how you operate is going to change things, right? So, you didn't build that, that model to tell you, I'm assuming you don't know how it's predicting how many kilometers you have left, right? Best case, 20, 30% accuracy, right? But if you actually took the time and sat there and built that model, you picked the sensor, you figured out how it's going to calculate that, would you trust it better? Of course you would, right? So why wouldn't you do the same for this artificial intelligence? This is monitoring a $10 million batch in an autoclave, right? This company says, I'll just give you a magic box, right? Or you can do it yourself and start to move that cheese yourself. Now, so what we did is not only did, did we have them involved in building the model, we called the model after them. So the head guy that was sponsoring this was Alfred. We called it the Alfred, right? So before they started a batch, they go, hey, I wonder what the Alfred's telling us, right? You want to talk about culture change? That's a big win for us, right? So we train the model. We choose the influencing factors. Influencing factors are what gets fed into that model. And I can tell you what, it was a surprise. It's a different project than this, but data science was telling us these are the most important things to have in your model. They have the highest influencing factor to train this model on. The end user who knows this process so well said, I, I don't know, <laughs> so I think it's this. Come on, data science, buddy, catch up, right? No, so we trained a model without it, then we trained a model with it. Guess what one was better? It was, it was the second one, just in case you wanna know, right? It was interesting, right, all of a sudden, even though all this technology we have, the domain expert that's been operating that plant knew it better than the data scientist, right? Data scientist has never stepped foot in your plant. You probably never will, right? He's just looking at data. It's just data, right? So all of a sudden, we had them involved at the first step of looking at how this thing's going to fail. We had them involved in, in what sensors we choose. So if, if you go out there and do an IoT project and you just think you're just going to add a bunch of sensors for the sake of adding sensors, Right? That's a very dangerous thing to do. So we got involved with choosing the sensors we're going to do. Right? And we also had them involved in changing the model. I think that's a good culture change. Right? The Alfred, the, the Alfred, Alfred built the Alfred. Right? So this is an example of what's happening of the output of this. So every second of every day, it's taking a, uh, an input from that ultrasound. It's taking input from the vibration. It's taking input from the pressure, depending on all the sensors we have. Right? And some of these sensors are just, they're inherently on that device, and that's another point I'll get across, but it's giving us an anomaly score. Zero is, yep, hey, everything's perfectly what I thought it would be. I'm the model talking now, right? And 100% is, that's completely opposite of what I thought it'd be. So this is, happens to be vibration. This happens to be peak view by Emerson Technology. This is the, um, oh, this is the anomaly scores going on for the current, right? So you can start to see, um, do I have a power? Okay, but anyways. The zero's normal, right? So you start to see some spikes, right? If anyone knows failures and understands how failures happen, failures rarely fix themselves unless you kick something, right? So they're not gonna pop in for a second and they go back down. So if I have an anomaly score of 70, 80, 90, and it's just for a second and it goes back down to a lower level, that's because the data, it just, the model hasn't seen that data. Someone could have opened the door, someone could have clanged into something with something, right? It's just, oh, it's gone, right? Now, now, do you think there's something wrong? You guys are valve experts, right? Do you think there's something wrong with this one? Right? So you can see a big failure at the start and a lot of orange. That's not good, right? That's actually one of the big wings we, wins we caught with this. Um, again, this is a pressure sensor. And again, you guys are all pressure sensor experts, right? Does this look normal? The answer is no, right? So this is ended up what we end up delivering to them. They wanted a dashboard. Yes, we send text messages, we send emails if they get to a certain point where we need to alert them of an impending, right? Uh, the way this works is at the top, there is a stock ticker, 
right? This is meant for production people. They're sitting there looking at it. This is essentially the Alfred, okay? They're looking at this and going, is there any anomalies? That's a, 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 just a, a 10 second average of the anomaly score telling you if it's going up or down. Um, over on the left hand side, you see some basic insights, which I, which I think is gonna come out of this digital transformation uh, around OEE availability and stuff like that. And then you have your alarms and you have your storyboard about the past batches and things like that. So this is actually a, a, a good win for us that actually helped us push that project forward because as I said, it, I failed twice, right? So it's, you need <laughs> some momentum to keep the, the project going. So when that autoclave was in standby, we had uh, these six alarms come in at a very high level anomaly. So if I had showed you the trend, it would have been a lot of orange, right? Regardless, the operations team decided to run that batch, right? So they started the batch at 11.29. As going through that batch, as more valves started opening and closing, there was more um, anomalies that came in. And eventually, uh, the compressed air alarm low came in. That's a hardwired sensor on the autoclave, and then the batch aborted, right? So essentially, two hours before that happened, we started to see some anomalies, right? The thing is, I couldn't tell you what it was. I couldn't say, hey, go fix your... your um, your compressed air, you got a compressed air problem, right? I didn't know. Well, all I knew is these valves are normally in a energized state and they weren't opening, so that's what you need to go look at. But now I do know. Now I do know if I see this pattern, this looks like a compressed air failure. You should go and actually start to get to the root cause. So lessons learned. Um, no algorithm or data can substitute a workaround for good reliability practices when we're talking about predictive maintenance. AI has a lot of potential outside of predictive maintenance. All the case studies I'm hearing is really focusing on predictive maintenance. I would challenge you to look at safety and quality and other things as well. Um, humans play the most critical role in making these algorithms successful. So one thing you need to consider too, if you're considering using AI at your plant or if you're a vendor of bringing it in is AI is dynamic, it's living, right? And it got brought up earlier this morning is you change a sensor, you change the location of that sensor, you're gonna to need to retrain that model. Either you invest in data science people, right, and they're about $450,000, if the good ones, right, they're already gone to Google and everything. So you go get yourself a few of those, right, because it is an evolving process that you're gonna to have to retrain that model, and I was surprised how often you need to do it. Okay, so keep that in mind. A black box approach is not gonna work. Don't give me a black box and tell me the world's gonna change, right? We need to make sure that we help the customers move that cheese. Um, and IoT is just not adding new sensors, right? Um, I grew up in the world through Rosemount of, of automating these process plants. I know there's a lot of sensors out there that can tell you a lot of good things, right? My recommendation if you're going down this path is to start with the sensors you have. Do not add any additional sensors. Um, and another thing that I'm gonna add on here that's not on here, in terms of whether it's you're actually doing AI or machine learning or some kind of predictive analytics, if a vendor comes to you and says, give me your data and I will find the answers you're looking for, bad strategy. My recommendation is start with finding out the right answers and figuring out which data you need to solve it. Because chances are you might need to get some uh, merge the IT, O2, IT, <laughs> IT, OT, ET world to get all that data in one place, right? So don't just start with saying your data and say, tell me what, you, what can you get from that, right? Start by asking the right question. Thank you.